Mr. Gilbreth, would you like to reserve some of your time for rebuttal? No? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I'll... You want a one minute warning? Uh, sure. I don't think I'll go, um, but that would be great. Okay. Thank you. So my remarks are brief. I, I want to start kind of like I started my opening. It is not every single case that me and Ms. Kinsler are involved in or you hear where both sides are saying the other parent wants what's best for the child and has has the best interest at heart. Um, and I appreciate both Mr. Hendricks saying that and Ms. Mitchum saying that about the other parent. This is just a situation. You can look at Petitioner's Exhibit 2. We can talk about trust and what's spent and what's reimbursed or not. It's a $3.5 million piece of property in Lakeway. The property taxes on the alone on that would eat into my client's resources and to Thomas's resources. My client said, uh, and, and they are blessed that they, her parents were able to leave uh, some money to both Thomas's care for a special need trust and to Ms. Mitchum, who is going to be taking care of Thomas full time. They are blessed for that, but it's not a limitless blessing. And you can see that in Petitioners 24. You can see that when Ms. Kinsler goes through their exhibit and says, well, look at this withdrawal made by the trustee. Look at this withdrawal made by the trustee. Look at the cost of probate. You can see that through their cross-examination of my client, that this is not a limitless blessing uh, and that this money, uh, and by the way, if there is any money left over, it would be going to Gemma. Um, but the move, like my client testified in her deposition, like my client testified today, the move is inevitable. Uh, they cannot stay in a $3.5 million house and pay those property taxes that is not feasible, and there is going to have to be a move, which she has the right to do under the divorce decree. And I appreciate Ms. Kinsler saying, um, as I heard her say, that there has been a material and substantial change. Um, and I think legally, clearly, there has been a material and substantial change in circumstances in the life of both the conservators uh, and the child. And so that brings you into best interest. And ultimately, this is about best interest of Gemma. And courts all the time make best interest determinations that take into consideration everything that's going on with the parents that may not be fun for one or both of the parents, but it's just the reality of what we have. And the courts all the time make Travis County and contiguous geographic restrictions or Travis County in one county and make that uh, best interest determination. Obviously, it's a case by case scenario. Um, and that's not easy. And that is difficult for co-parents. It is difficult having your life tied to another individual, an, an individual who you've gone through a divorce with, and your life is tied to that individual until your child is 18, really past the age of 18. But your, your life could be affected by something going on in the other conservator's life. That is every single court order out there. Uh, this case, they agreed to Travis County, and they did that at a time whenever my client was living in Lakeway with her mom. Uh, she was living with her mom at the time of the divorce. That's when the agreement was for Travis County. Her mom has passed unexpectedly. Um, 69 is a young age to pass. And I think both sides said that is unexpected. And then she lost her father. And now this is what happens. And we have an inevitable move. You know, a little bit ironically, it's Mr. Hendricks in a certain way is better off with the modification. Because if my client had decided, look, I'm just going to move to Lago Vista. I don't need to change the decree or whatever. There's lots of remedies that the court has available today to make things more feasible or palatable for Mr. Hendricks that if my client had just said, you know what, I'm, I don't need a modification, I'm just moving, exchanges are school to school, FaceTime's reasonable under the divorce decree, um, and then we meet, you know, we do exchanges at each other's residence and the few exchanges that you don't have the child. Um, and then we'd be looking at an hour drive versus an hour and 15 minutes. And so when you think about this, there's lots of remedies, of ways. It's not necessarily just a yes or no. Burnett County just gets plopped into the divorce decree. You could sit there and say, Burnett County, but if mom moves, we're going to tighten up the geographic restriction that it doesn't include all of Travis County. Or if mom moves, this is where she has to live. And if she doesn't live there, they would have to be Lakeway, and that's it. Um, so there's always that fear of, well, what happens if she moves now, and then she moves again, and she moves again? You have that available at your disposal to tighten the geographic restriction. You have the ability, dad, for example, is below cap support at the divorce decree. He was cap support plus pays for half of extracurriculars. And then we go round and around of, is it agreed? Was it not agreed? 
but that, that's you could just say, well, you really should be at 1840, but I'll give you a break on your child support. Or if he's Mr. not going to do his Thursday. Yes. Sorry. Uh, got about a minute left, and I think Michelle was having a little bit of trouble keeping up. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Bag. So there's lots of things that that are available to the court um, that could make this work. It's not a fun situation. I get that. Um, I think it goes to the fees, too, of both sides. It's a good faith dispute. I understand Mr. Hendricks's position. I certainly understand Ms. Mitchum's. It is not, um, this is unexpected, this happened. But I think ultimately, if we think about Gemma uh, and what's best for her, uh, her mom being able to move to a place that can, she can afford, move into a place um, that she has free and clear and in Burnett County, one county over, uh, is in the best interest of this child. 